Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. It's called the Poverty Trap, and it's a trap that has captured thousands of people here in southeastern Minnesota, leaving many with really no way to escape. Hello, I'm Eric Olson with KSMQ Public Television. Join us now for a conversation about the Poverty Trap with some people, a great group here who work very closely with poverty and with homeless people every day. We'll get a state perspective on poverty and a regional view, primarily from Rochester and the Olmstead County area. We'll also have a special viewing from a local documentary called Disrupting Generational Poverty. Stay tuned for Tripping the Poverty Trap. A poverty trap is caused by a cycle of circumstances that force poverty to persist, created due to a mix of factors working together to keep an individual or an entire family in poverty. This trap can continue across generations, and when this happens, it's known as generational poverty. Although the poverty rate has been declining in the last few years, the official poverty rate in the United States was about 10.5% in 2019. That represents about 34 million people. In 2018, the poverty rate in Minnesota was close to the national average at 10%. We have a wonderful group here to discuss this issue. Uh, welcome them all. Jennifer Ho, Commissioner of Minnesota Housing. Sheila Cascaden, Olmstead County Commissioner from District 6. John Edmonds, Program Manager at the Olmstead County Child and Family Services and co-founder of Project Legacy. Sydney Fry, Program Supervisor at Family Service Rochester and Adjunct Professor at North Central University. And finally, Joe Marie Morris, Represent ex-director, founder of the Jeremiah Program in Rochester. Thank you all so much for taking time to chat about this very difficult issue. And Joe Marie, we're going to watch a little bit more about, about the operation, the Jeremiah, the new house program coming up in a little bit. I wonder if we could start with you and just give us a working definition. We use that, that term poverty, poverty trap, and it's not just a trite like a phrase, it means something legitimate. Can you give us a definition, please? I would say it's it's cycle of poverty. And as you had referenced earlier, Eric, sometimes over many generations. And it's really caused by systematic, deep-rooted systematic barriers. And the only way to really break down those barriers are intervention. So um, thoughtful intervention um, in many different ways. Commissioner Ho, could you please outline in the state our housing shortage problem? We see usually just on the news, uh, and frankly, uh, in southeastern Minnesota, we see news from the Twin Cities, encampments, things changing in the metro area with a real uh, poverty and housing crisis. Is that uh, sort of a microcosm of the entire state? Give us a, a little lay of the land, if you would, please. Uh, well, first, Eric, thanks uh, for, for doing this and having us all together. It's great to be with this uh, group of people. I um, So let, let me just ask answer Joe Marie's question first. Like poverty mean, to me means you don't have enough money to get by, right? And we've got indexes and standards and things that measure um, like what that is. But if you're a family, you're a single adult, and you don't have enough money to just be able to get by, you're poor. I um, And I think that what we've seen specifically in housing, since I'm the housing commissioner, is that before COVID, uh, we just didn't have enough homes in Minnesota compared to the number of households. And it's really, in many ways, a really simple math supply demand thing, right? 
We stopped building for a while when the housing crash happened in 2007, 2008, but the number of households in Minnesota continued to slowly increase, just kind of naturally, and you end up with a shortage of homes to households. And when that happens, rents go up and the price of new homes or buying a home goes up. And at the same time that the price of housing went up, uh, people's wages, especially people at the lower income of uh, jobs, those wages didn't go up at the same pace. So you just end up with this gap between what you make and what you can afford. And uh, that's, the, that's the housing shortage issue that we had before COVID. And obviously uh, what COVID did is uh, just really uh, put a bright light on how important it is to have a home, a stable home, a home that you can afford, because it was the number one public health strategy that we had to fight the pandemic, you know, stay at home. And I, um, and you mentioned homelessness. Um, yeah, I had one homeless outreach worker in Minneapolis explain it this way. I thought it was a great way to put it. The general strategy for people who didn't have a home at all, people who were living outside, was to keep them moving along, move along, move along, move along. And when Metro Transit was working and when public buildings were open and coffee shops were open, people could just keep moving along. And when we stopped, people sat down. And suddenly the problem that was with us the whole time growing and, and getting worse, and I'll, I'll make a note in all parts of the state, it just became more visible. And uh, yeah, I think that's forced a conversation about uh, homelessness and poverty uh, that's actually perhaps a bit more uh, front and center than what we were having before COVID. Are we, uh, are, is our problem in Minnesota similar in size to states around us? You know, I, I, I never know quite what to say about states around us because we're so different than North Dakota, you know? I mean, I think they have a 12th of our population, if I'm right. I, um, there are places where the housing market is worse you know, I mean, uh, I was out in Washington, D.C. for a while. You know, I fainted the first time I rented an apartment out there. I mean, it was just ridiculous. I, um, there are places that are really uh, in decline. And so uh, the economy is their issue, not their housing stock. I, um, but there's no part of Minnesota that I've been in um, back when I used to get to travel around the state that didn't want more housing and didn't need more housing, uh, didn't want uh, you don't want help doing more of what it is that, that my agency, the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency, does. Uh, Sydney Fry, you are a program supervisor at Family Service Rochester, but you also teach at North Central University. And I wonder, are your students, are, are some of them living this reality while they're attending your classes? Are they aware of the seriousness of this issue? Well, I mean, I think the issue of poverty definitely um, is prevalent um, within generations that are coming up. And um, many of the students that attend the North Central is actually located uh, in um, downtown Minneapolis. Um, and so um, the campus is actually, um, you know, not far from some of those encampments that you referenced. So um, some of the obviously some of the students that attend there, they have a, have a different lived experience. Um, but they are becoming well acclimated with the reality of poverty um, and seeing it up front and close. And so I think it's just obviously uh, presents teachable moments, right? About, um, you know, what what role does um, the opportunity that they've been afforded through education, um, I mean, and what responsibility to use that education to be able to be a bridge and help, you know, others that may have not had those same opportunities um, I think that's something that's important that's, you know, may not be in a textbook or, you know, part of the curriculum or scope and sequence, but I think that's something that um, we endeavor to try to, to message for sure. And uh, Commissioner Cascade, and I know you had your hand up before, I'm sorry. Uh, give us the Olmstead County uh, perspective on this. Well, what I, what I put my hand up is poverty can certainly lead to homelessness. But homelessness and poverty, when they walk side by side, all the homeless are not in, are not in, in poverty isn't the only pathway to homelessness. And part of the challenge with homelessness is you have people who, um, you know, I'm looking at John Edmonds, who works with adolescents. You have adolescents who have to leave home for other reasons. Their family might not be in poverty, but those kids are thrown out. You have domestic violence situations. You have mental health problems. We have substance abuse problems. And in our system in Minnesota, we've said, I was once on a panel with Sue Aberholden from 
uh, the um, Mental Health Alliance, and she said, we don't have a mental health system in Minnesota. And that's, that does lead people who are seriously mentally ill to be on the streets. Not all of the people who are homeless are there because they're in poverty. And, and I think um, dealing with poverty is, and the intergenerational cycle of poverty, which really does exist, you have to look at broad systems and you look at things like what makes, what makes a family vulnerable and, and what are the, I, I, heard, uh, I heard our former uh, uh, social service director talk about the prison of poverty. And our systems do keep people trapped in poverty. If you have a low wage job and, you, and you're spending most of your income on housing, you can't invest in your children's education. If, you're, if, you're, if your daycare is too expensive, if you don't have a car, there's a lot of things that trap people into never getting out of the cycle of poverty. And then if we add to that, some of the things that we're only beginning to really talk about in Minnesota, which is the structural racism that exists in different ways that keeps certain populations. You don't speak English. If you, if you know, we've got a lot of history that, that contributes to people not being able to get out of, of a cycle of poverty as well. So I just wanted to be sure. Now, when you come to homeless, we have our the recent most survey is we have about 200 people that were identified in our survey but we're doing programs with the schools because of the kids who are at risk of homelessness. Um, but then let's look more broadly. We have about 2,500 families that we work with every year who are, are, are here because of fam needing family supports uh, just to get kind of get by in a variety of ways. So, you know, if you don't have enough daycare, you can't go to work. I mean, there's lots of things that put people into a cycle where they can't get to the place that they really are self-sufficient, that they really can advance themselves and their children. And that's the kind of thing I think the Jeremiah program really addresses at the root causes. What are the root causes of being trapped? And John Edmonds, you are nodding your head. You work with families on a daily basis. And uh, this is a reality for, for many folks. Yes, indeed it is. I mean, one of the things I wanted to, I want to, put out there so that we're clear is that there, there's a dynamic that's inherent with, with uh, generational poverty that isn't the same as situational poverty, if you will. And by that, I mean that, that once you've, you've been subjected to you know, systemic oppression or historical trauma or any of you know, those kinds of things over the course of generations, what, all, what happens is that you begin to develop an internal working model which, which basically is, is um, disempowered. And that's different than if, you, and, and, and how that illustrates itself is that most of us, and I would, I would suspect that all of us here in this virtual room kind of operate on a cause and effect model. I mean, we understand that, that, this, that we take one action, this leads to a particular consequence or outcome, but that implies that we have power over our, um, over our, our over our environment, that we have some control in 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 a, um, people coming out of that with that internal working model out of generational poverty have lost that and have a different sort of worldview, which is more of what I like to call an effect and cause worldview, where things happen and then they react, and there is not a sense of empowerment or ability to control and modify an impact environment. And so what that, that does is present some very particular challenges when you're trying to help people move out of that. And I know, I think Joe Marie is gonna talk about some of that because I know that, that that's rooted in a lot of the work that the Jeremiah Project does, but it means that we have to be clear on what it is that is operating internally with folks because that then drives the kinds of interventions that we're, that we're gonna put in place. Commissioner uh, Ho, you're familiar a little bit with Olmstead County and Rochester's programs. Uh, they're on, they seem to be on, uh, how are they doing? What's your assessment? You know, one of the things that's so impressive about Olmstead County is that, you know, it, it, like most parts of government, we tend to do things in silos. We have different p pieces and parts over here, but people aren't siloed. They're an integrated whole. 
And what, what Olmstead County has done a really good job is putting its, its healthcare and human services programs, its public health programs, and its housing uh, programs all in one place and really appreciating that you have people who present with more than one need. And if you can solve for uh, many of those things at the same time, uh, one, it's more effective and two, it's just easier. And ultimately, I think the county, I defer to Commissioner Cascaden on this, but it's probably more cost effective in the long run for the county because less expensive bad things happen and, and more good things happen that get people kind of on a path of not needing to have some of those supports for the long term. So I just, I just really admire it. And, and Olmstead County is, I think, one of the only ones, I think Dakota County has done some of that work. And there's just not a lot of counties in the state. And so really trying to figure out how to organize around the needs of people and not being afraid to ask questions about the needs of people who have not done well with services organized the way they were historically organized. How do you really help the people that need the help the most? So hats off to y'all in Olmstead County. And all of these agencies though, they need that philosophy, that basis that John Emmons was talking about, don't they, to understand where we're coming at this problem from. If you have different agencies who maybe not aren't fully aware of that cycle and uh, the, the, the prejudice inherent in the system, they're not gonna work very well together. And I think it's just that you need people to believe that people want to do well and that you're supporting them to do well, as opposed to judging uh, who we think is gonna do well and who we think isn't gonna do well and creating barriers to people getting what they need. It's really interesting you say that, um, Commissioner Ho, too, because one of the first things when I started with Jeremiah program is discussion with Gloria Perez and the team about they really tried to predict who was going to do well in the program and who wasn't going to do well, and they were really bad at it, right? They were really bad. And what they what they did, though, was they, they started the prerequisite of the empowerment program, and it's just something that John actually just touched on. So really, to, to be part of Jeremiah program, you, you, you go through the 16-week empowerment program to really help kind of reshape that whole cause and effect versus effect versus cause um, that John is talking about, because it's a whole new way of learning and understanding. And, and, and one of the things I really, I just wanted to touch on um, with Olmstead County is the integration of services between health, housing, and human services I mean, for, for, some, for an organization like Jeremiah Program, it has been invaluable because I can talk to the, the housing commissioner who can also talk to John Edmonds. So family services is talking to housing. They actually have social, social workers embedded in, in housing, which makes so much sense. And it really serves the participants in our program and our county, um, the, the, the most vulnerable people in our county so well. And we're gonna get a catch uh, a little bit about Jeremiah, about your program. Uh, first, I wanna just remind folks watching right now that you are watching Tripping the Poverty Trap here on KSMQ Public Television. The Jeremiah program recently made a documentary called Disrupting Generational Poverty. Let's take a look at a edited version, a shortened version of the film, and then we'll continue our discussion. There are two public health crises, COVID and also the awakening of many people about how racism is so pervasive. We often engage with poverty as an economic issue. It's actually a social justice one. Justice is a community issue. We don't have a poverty system in this country that works. We have a poverty system that is a poverty prison. The systems in place almost virtually make it impossible for somebody to move out of generational poverty. Women are twice as likely if they're single moms to be at the poverty level. You can't pay your rent, you've got medical issues with your child, you have educational challenges for yourself, it's not necessarily always safe. Jobs that don't pay enough for people to build wealth. A child that is raised in not just poverty, but being homeless, they may never recover. Jeremiah oh, wow. is one of the nation's most successful strategies to end the cycle of poverty for single moms and their children two generations at a time. 
providing safe, affordable housing for career track, college education, on-site early childhood education for their children, life skills and empowerment training, and then this community of support. Things started getting rocky for me is when my parents got separated. My dad had a gambling addiction, and when he left the home is when um, I started looking to different things, a lot of fear, and there was definitely a lot of anger. From ages 12 to 15, um, my, my drug abuse went to addiction, and that's when I first started um, experimenting with methamphetamine. For 10 years, I was um, in different chemical dependency treatments. My um, mental health was never addressed. I was never in a supportive, structured place for long enough. When I turned 18, I um, made a bad decision and I was seeing somebody who was using drugs and I ended up getting pregnant with my first son, Justice, and moved in with my kid's dad. He was really um, emotionally, physically abusive, involved in crime, criminal behavior. So my dreams and hopes for the future would be doing local social work, victim advocacy for women in recovery or people that struggle with mental health. Having Grace with me um, is another reminder of just what I've overcame and that I am supposed to be a mother to her and that keeps me going throughout the day is God's grace and my grace. For a mom to be a participant in Jeremiah program, um, they have to be attending college, they have to be working or volunteering part-time, their children have to be going to the Early Learning Center, the Child Development Center. They have to be meeting with their family coaches. Uh, they have to be attending weekly life skills classes. My mom, she had a drug addiction. She was using drugs when I was born. We've never lived in a place for more than a year. Um, in and out of shelters, foster care. Childhood wasn't really childhood because we had to worry about like survival. I struggled a lot with like behaviors though. Like I fought a lot, I fought a ton. I fought a ton in middle school and high school. I started just to know like there was more to life. You know, I start reflecting on my childhood and I didn't want to be like my mom or what I've seen. I knew like I could do more, like I knew I was smart and I've always had it in me, like I can do more. And that's when I started getting introduced to like the healthcare field and I decided to do the CNA program and I decided to do the PCA program. And at that time I was working in long-term care and I started to see there's nurses, there's doctors, there's more. I have Marley and Riley. I was very scared to be a mom because I didn't know what a mom was. So I was never taught the I love you's, the hugs, the kisses, like I knew I had to do that. I just didn't think that I could be like a good mom, like I would be enough. So yeah, I really, now I'm gonna get emotional. Yeah, like, I, um, yeah, I'm sorry. It's a holistic training that when we say that the moms are empowered through this, it's both psychologically and then just the fundamentals, right? You're giving them the educational foundation, you're developing the skills, they show up every week, they do their homework, they're engaged. Um, they start to recognize this is a long-term commitment and there's gonna be a long-term change. When they start believing in themselves, it really does change who they are. Knowing that education is the greatest weapon to, to change a life and change the world. We take people from a lower 10% economic, uh, and then we take them to an upper economic, just from getting a, a two-year degree, where they can go from a, an hourly wage to a salary wage and you get a family sustaining wage from picking a career. There are barriers um, in front of this talent that has been created by society, by their situation, 
and um, we work to try to remove those barriers. Those empowerment coaches, those life skill coaches can come in there and start challenging them to think about what about five years from now, what about ten years from now, what's their trajectory, and then that creates a career for someone who's laying uh, talent pipeline, uh, connectivity in the community, not only are we focused on the moms, but we're also focused on that future generation of children that come through this program as well. We have um, a partnership now with Families First of Minnesota that's providing Head Start and Early Head Start for all of our families. Nobody can build a, a building like a Jeremiah program uh, complex by themselves. It takes a, a bunch of committed partners, it takes vision, it takes years, oftentimes, lots of funding sources. One of the most exceptional things about how Jeremiah program Southeast Minnesota came together was this incredible cross-sector support. The Coalition for Rochester Area Housing, the collaboration of the Mayo Clinic, um, the City of Rochester, Olmsted County provided funding. It was this initial cross-sector support that was really allowed us to leverage further funding from the state of Minnesota. We're able to leverage resources across systems that most places don't. There's no county organized like ours in the state of Minnesota, and very few are across the country. One of the things we could do is look at our HRA and say, hey, um, project-based vouchers. And that was one of the key financial strategies to getting this program open. You know, right as we were establishing the coalition and bringing that, that philanthropic funding was right at the time when Jeremiah program was starting to come to fruition here. And so as we looked at the innovative and different ways that we can help support affordable housing here in Rochester in Southeast Minnesota, this was one of the first projects that came forward. This is a program that has worked and, and has shown a track record of success. The private and the public sectors, the faith-based communities, come together for different reasons. I don't think we can do one without the other. I think we all need to contribute. It really also uh, took advantage of the unique aspects of a successful model that has a partnership between between private foundations like our own, between individuals, and between the government um, program. So we saw that as a long-term uh, benefit for sustainability. We as a society owe them that kind of support system so the next generation can even be better than the one they came from. We are all collaborating to make the next generation even more progressive than the ones that have been behind us. They have the hope, resiliency, determination, and perseverance, but the systems that are in place make it very difficult for them to move out of poverty. It's almost a cliche to say that it takes a village to, to build a family, but it's not a cliche. All of the many faceted things that are in one's larger community that have anything to say or anything to do with helping a family raise its children, the community can add if they want. The problem is they're all siloed. They don't really communicate with each other. And the Jeremiah program is so unique in that this, this group comes together and works together for the same mission and same purpose. And we are back. That was a little clip of the new documentary about the Jeremiah program, new building. Joe Marie, talk a little bit about how this came about. So Jeremiah program is one of the nation's most successful strategies to disrupt poverty for single moms and their children two generations at a time. I am uh, from Southeast Minnesota, a local Minnesota farm girl, um, had practiced law for 20 years and really wanted to do something I was passionate about in, um, in uh, in, in making some changes. And I had heard about Paul Fleisner's interest in bringing a Jeremiah program to uh, Southeast Minnesota. Paul Fleisner is a director of health, housing and human services in Olmsted County for many years. And um, so we put together some leadership of cross-sector support um, to really solve the, the issues that were really a, a conf configuration of issues that had, had been going on in, in Southeast Minnesota. So we had 
28,000 um, single moms living in poverty in Southeast Minnesota. We had this huge problem with um, affordable housing. And we also had this great uh, initiative that was happening with Mayo Clinic and DMC, where they were looking for skilled workforce. So we thought, what a great opportunity to be able to launch a program campus in Southeast Minnesota so that we will be able to you know, bring in the skilled workforce, address these issues of, of uh, poverty for single mothers, and also be able to provide you know, this latter step up of education for, for both single moms and their children. Because it's not just the here and now that is the problem. Commissioner Ho, the, we've heard several times in our conversation here the generational aspect, the systemic aspect of these problems, and that's a whole other layer. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, if you take a look at what becomes an obstacle to people uh, becoming a homeowner or being getting uh, the next rental unit and how disproportionately uh, systems impact uh, poor people and, and people of color, I mean, in, in kids in school, um, you know, uh, poor black kids are more likely to be disciplined in school. Um, you know, uh, 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 being pulled over, you know, getting a criminal justice record. Um, you know, there's just uh, credit. Um, you know, uh, the, the way that, that there's kind of predatory action that gets people in a situation where they have bad credit. Um, our eviction laws in the state, um, it's kind of a one strike you're out. Uh, you get an eviction on your record just because it's filed, not because uh, the landlord won in court. And so, you know, these things stack up and they stack up in disproportionate ways. So there are ways in which the system works to just make it harder and harder and harder for folks uh, to get ahead. And I, um, it, it, this is making me remember um, a woman who uh, I got to know, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago, who was a resident at Jeremiah in Minneapolis. And, uh, you know, she had struggled with homelessness. She, she uh, went through Jeremiah housing and now she owns her own home and she's a home ownership counselor to help other uh, people get into home ownership. I mean, that's an amazing tra trajectory, but it's also, you know, a lot, of, a lot of work on her part, a, a lot of motivation, a lot of sustained effort and a lot of support. I, uh, but uh, yeah, I got a chance to, to run into her actually in the filming of the documentary. And it's just extraordinary to realize not only is she a homeowner herself, so from homelessness to homeowner, but also that that's, her, that's now her calling. That's what she's doing for other folks. And Sydney Fry, I suppose you have similar stories, perhaps anecdotes of uh, relationships you have made either uh, with your work government or teaching? Yeah, um, I can think of a few individuals that come to mind that, you know, as we think about this poverty trap, we're talking about how the system um, earlier, we we're sharing how, you know, integration helps um, folks move forward, but also now we're reflecting on the reality that oftentimes the system that is supposed to help, uh, you know, open up that trap door is really um, co-conspiring against those same individuals to keep them trapped inside. Um, one thing that I, I, one example of this I could think of um, where the system's actually working um, in favor of individuals uh, would be through my work with Father Project. Uh, we work with underemployed or unemployed fathers, many of which are in recovery or returning citizens. And oftentimes, as you, as you can think of the things that continue to keep people trapped, you know, an ex-offender, you know, right, that felony conviction could be a, a significant barrier to housing, which, you know, without stable housing, it's difficult to, to move the needle any further. And so um, one of the things that has happened here within Olmstead County is that, again, with that integration work, um, we've been able to partner with HRA, our local housing redevelopment authority, uh, where they've taken on master leasing um, for individuals that are part of the father project. So basically, um, the county is on the hook as the, the leasee, and they sublease to individuals that are coming through our program that might have some of those barriers, right, to, to housing. And so th being able to remove that felony conviction barrier for somebody who's just trying to get back on their feet, I mean, that opens up a lot of doors. And we've seen dads that have been able to um, take advantage of that opportunity, not only to be able to get involved again in their kid's life, 
but then go on to be able to gain employment um, and then, you know, even pursue education. Some of them um, are, are working on becoming social workers or uh, alcohol and drug counselors um, as a result of that opportunity that they've had uh, to be able to secure, you know, that most basic of human need, which is housing. So those are just some of the some of the things that would come to mind. So someone had to think that up. I mean, that did you think that up the HRA connection? That's really is it going to be those kinds of people just making thoughtful decisions that are very smart to try to change the systemic problems? Well, let me speak to that HRA master lease because that came about because we were working with young mothers who were too young to sign a lease. And so you have a woman who's, who's uh, you know, under 18 and she's a mom and she doesn't have a family who's supporting her. But she's working or going to school, but she can't sign a lease. So we found that if we, uh, if we signed the, we did the master lease and sublet to them based on their income, and then they are agreeing to work with social workers, it's a wonderful transition for them to get the skills they need, the security of their housing, and a good record as a renter. And so we that 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 model then we've used uh, successfully and then applied it to the father's project. And we're now doing it with some other populations that are hard to find permanent housing, stable housing. If you don't have a place to live, you spend so much energy, you know, your energy is diluted to where I'm going to sleep tonight and how I'm going to how I'm going to feed my kids or how I'm going to eat myself today. And you're you don't have the energy to uh, or the capacity. Uh, to focus on your future. And I, earlier we were talking about students. I've heard from our college that we have students who are homeless who couch surf at our technical college because they don't have a place to live. So what drive they have to go to school, work, they're working, going to school, but they don't have a place to live, but they want to get that degree because they know that's going to make the difference for their future. They have the empowerment that John Edmonds was talking about. So you know, you want to support that as well. I don't know if that answers your question exactly. It went a little field, but yeah. And folks at home, you're watching Tripping the Poverty Trap. I'm Eric Olson, KSMQ Public Television. Uh, we are meeting today with Commissioner of Minnesota Housing, Jennifer Ho, Sheila Cascaden, Olmstead County Commissioner, John Edmonds from Olmstead County Child and Family Services. And I want to ask, uh, uh, along with, I'm sorry, Joanne, Joe Marie Morris, representing Jeremiah Program, and Sydney Fry, Program Supervisor at Family Service Rochester. Uh, Commissioner Ho, is this what it takes? Individuals coming up with individual solutions, one at a time, to try to crack through the problems of this systemic institutional uh, problem that you brought up? Uh, I think it's about um, structures coming together in different ways. I, at the state, for example, we have an interagency council on homelessness, and it's a whole bunch of different members of the governor's cabinet. So my counterparts at the Department of Human Services, Health, Corrections, Higher Ed, Education, uh, and you know, getting together and trying to figure out, like, how do we take the tools that each of us from our own box has and put them together in new ways so that they work better for people. And um, you know, doing that cross-cutting work is what generates the ideas that say, let's do it differently. Because if all you're doing is kind of running compliance on a program and looking down and looking down, you're not actually kind of looking up and figuring out what do people need and how do we put the pieces back together again in a way such that it is easier for people to get what they need as opposed to just, I'm administering my program, right? <laughs> and, and I think that that's the creative energy, but it's also very person-centered. I know down in Rochester, you guys use fancy words like human-centered design and stuff like that, but it's really about like, what does a person need? What does a person need to get from point A to point B? And, and sometimes that just means listening. Like I, uh, one of the best pieces of advice I got in, in my work on homelessness is what you ask people what they need and then you give it to them. I agree, Commissioner Ho. One of my favorite sayings is, is listening is not waiting for your turn to talk. Um, and 
one, I just wanted to really, I, I agree with what Commissioner Ho has said, and I think that that's what's been so exciting about what we've been doing in Olmstead County too, is that building a kind of a continuum of services. We have a, a consortium of nonprofits who look at gaps, who work together. I mean, Jeremiah program couldn't be as effective as it is because unless we were working with Family Service Rochester, who's providing on-site mental health services for our single moms, um, our, our local food bank, Channel One, who's delivering individual meals for our families twice a week to help support them. It's that integration and finding the gaps and, and supporting one another. I'll give you another example. You know, We also work with the Women's Shelter. Women's Shelter does an amazing job in stabilizing uh, women who've been through trauma and violence. Well, that gets them through the first piece, but then what about once they're stabilized? Well, we're using our um, long-term homeless units um, at Jeremiah campus to try to um, move some of those women who have been stabilized into Jeremiah program and support them into their trajectory for a career in education. And again, it's it's really about figuring out what the gaps are and coming together with solutions uh, community wide. And I think that that's one thing that that we've been really good at. And speaking of community solutions and uh, individuals making a difference, uh, John Edmonds, your co-founder of Project Legacy. Talk about that a little bit. Well, Project Legacy is a is a program for um, youth and youth of color, uh, and really youth defined as folks between eighteen and and twenty five, um, who have been victims of abuse and neglect, um, who have come out of those generational poverty environments who've lacked a sense of, of hope and uh, and it's really reconnecting them to, the work is has been around reconnecting them to a, a connections access legacy paradigm where um, we're trying to instill hope, give them the means and the supports and basically the way we kind of look at things is, is we're trying to substitute for uh, families that a lot of these youth, and they've been homeless also, many of them. Uh, we're trying to substitute for the families that, that we have, like my family or um, some of you know, our, other, our other colleagues, middle-class folks have, uh, to provide all the necessary supports for kids to thrive and to move forward. So we, we help with, education, we help with housing, we help with, um, you know, it may be a, a situation where um, kids are, are hungry, so we help, we have, you know, we help with food. Um, we try to really meet all the basic needs that these kids have, or young people have. They're not, we, we've tried to, to kind of focus on an, on uh, a cohort that tends to get missed. I mean, so when you get to be 18, you kind of, kind of fall out of out of this child and family system and sort of where do you go? And so we're we're focused on those folks who've um, you know, where there's this sort of hole, this gap in services. And so we've we've been in existence now for about eight or nine years. And over that the course of that time, we've helped kids get into college and and we've supported them through college. We've got probably about 50 or 50 or 60 kids right now, I can't remember the exact number, who are in college all across the country. Uh, we're starting on a new uh, program with uh, Rochester Community and Technical College and as well as, as uh, Winona State to work with African-American and other kids of students of color to increase the likelihood that they will continue through graduation. Because there's been an issue with a lot of those kids because of the other kinds of challenges that they experience, they tend not to be able to, to um, stay in school. So we're, we're, we're working in a partnership with, with um, RCTC and WSU to um, ensure that those kids get the supports that they need to move through graduation. And then we do, we also work on, we also provide healing circles to help kids deal with their trauma. 
uh, there's a whole bunch of things that we do. So that's great. I in the few minutes we have left, the general population watching, uh, maybe they feel there's nothing they can do as an individual. Do you all have? There are all these different groups. Do they all want volunteers or? Uh, is there a, a definite thing that they could do and take action? There's a legislative session going on. And um, uh, legislators, uh, I think, are, are really starting to focus on housing needs in Minnesota. The Senate, for the first time, at least in, in, a, in a long time, maybe, uh, has a committee dedicated just to housing policy and finance now. Uh, we used to be uh, wrapped up with the Agriculture Committee. Uh, so uh, I think uh, if you believe that, you know, in order to succeed, Minnesotans need to have a, a, a safe and stable place to call home, just let your state representative and state senator know that that is an issue that you care about and ask them what they're doing to support policy and, and programs that, that help create that. That's a simple that's a simple phone call or two or an email or two, and it's something you can do from the safety of your own home. Absolutely, that's a great one. Any others? Really, there's so many different organizations in our, our county that are working with this population and trying to do different things. So whether it's the education program at Hawthorne School, which is really working with people to get them uh, really ready to, to be in the workforce and have the skills they need to succeed, uh, whether it is uh, the Salvation Army, which does all sorts of work, volunteering at the warming center, Catholic Catholic Charities that is is uh, operating our warming center uh, overnight, and then the library and and, uh, and the landing for the homeless are doing the day center. Whether it's tutoring tutoring someone who needs who needs assistance uh, so that they can succeed in school. How would that person get integrate? to get to do tutoring? How, how would that happen? The, the, really, the catch-all thing to tell you is if you call United Way 211, they manage a whole list of different kinds of ways that you can volunteer. Everything from something that is as, as simple as writing a letter uh, and doing that kind of advocacy that the commissioner called for, to the tutoring, to, to, you know, to a whole variety of things. And they, they are working very hard to make sure that all the organizations that could use volunteers have their options listed with them. Um, and that's a, that's a very fast way for anyone. Joe Marie Morris, you, your new home, uh, we were talking before we went on, is full. Are you building more? Um, not building more, but finding more creative solutions to serve more families. We've done a lot of investment in technology, trying to reach more rural families, trying to really determine, you know, we've used this really as a springboard, this need to use to do virtual programming and virtual services to really uh, try to figure out how we can serve more beyond bricks and mortar, more families. And so um, we plan on serving more families beyond the 40 families that we have now, but in different ways. And that a lot of it is investment in, in technology. So providing laptops, providing hotspots for, for women who do have secure housing um, to really look at how we're prioritizing who will be having housing to try to think about ways to do working with landlords like this master leasing and, and other opportunities for other rural communities that we maybe haven't reached. Uh, you know, as a Minnesota farm girl, I'm, I'm excited to think about, you know, how can we start serving rural families um, that we haven't had the opportunity to do that before through technology and in other ways and in really creative partnerships. So I'm really hopeful that that will be something that will be um, in uh, the growth for Jeremiah program in the near future. And Sydney Fry, we haven't even talked about uh, folk, young people who have suffered abuse or domestic violence, how, what services they get. Uh, we haven't had much time to talk about that. That's a whole other uh, uh, part of the problem. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think when we're talking about how people can get involved in possible solutions, I mean, I think responding to the reality that you know, oftentimes generational poverty is a reflection of uh, generational experiences of trauma. And so many times, a lot of times, um, people that have not had an opportunity, um, and we haven't we really haven't even addressed uh, historical trauma, 
uh, in our context too. But looking at all those additional layers and factors that contribute um, to, um, you know, what causes an individual to find himself, uh, find him or herself in a place where they um, are in, impoverished. I think that's really critical. Um, mental health services are definitely a, a short in, in our community, um, but opportunities for folks to be able to connect. Uh, it's been tough, right? During our pandemic, uh, uh, I think mental health crisis is going to continue to to escalate because of social isolation. Um, that's kind of been a byproduct, and so I think there's a lot of young people that are are, are in the throes of that presently right now. Uh, and so being able to reach out and maybe be a connection and a source of uh, support for individuals, um, it's just kind of the neighborly thing to do, right? I mean, that sounds cliche, but um, I think that's needed now more than ever. Um, and so that human connection and that human touch, I know our society is kind of shifting away from that. But I think what COVID has really reminded of us is that that can significantly impact uh, the mental health, especially of those that have experienced, like you referenced, trauma and abuse. And so um, I think that would be one practical way for people to to make, uh, you, you know, a human connection. And many of those folks are, you mentioned COVID, we don't even know yet what the ramifications of that, of this is going to be with regard to mental health. Uh, people might not even know that they're suffering from isolation. Uh, I could see it in my own, my mother, my own family, how isolation just changed her in no time at all and lost much of her cognitive ability. We're, we're gonna be studying this for, for a long time. I know with many of the families that we're working with and we have um, different cohorts, but one is the teen moms, pregnant and parenting teens. We're seeing a, a, we're seeing indications of increased stress since since COVID. The kind of isolation that they're forced to experience right now, I think, is having a real devastating and negative impact on on their mental health. So. I think we're going to see more where I think obviously I think we're going to see more and more of that as time goes on. I mean, let's be let's be honest. I mean, COVID is having an impact on my mental health. I mean, this is really, really, really hard. And uh, people are out of work and people can't pay the bills and people are stressed. And and the public health strategy involves isolation, which is a word prior to the pandemic we always thought of as a bad thing. And so, you know, I just think we need to own the fact that uh, there's a lot of repair um, that needs to get done as the vaccine rolls out. And I really like this idea of not going back to normal, but let's use the opportunities uh, to really rebuild and, and, and really, uh, really try to create kind of healing growth and, and, and thriving opportunities for people that, that, that felt uh, like they didn't have a chance before the pandemic even hit. Uh, Joe Marie, I was only partially kidding about are you building more homes because, I mean, I was struck. It doesn't, it wouldn't be surprising, but how quickly it filled from the time we started filming the construction of it to now and just boom. Right. We, we opened our doors July 1st and by the end of the year, we were completely full with 40 families. So and despite the pandemic. Um, so that just goes to show what the need is in the community. One of the things I just wanna flip back to quick that we were just talking about is, you know, one of the integral pillars for Jeremiah program, and I know that John touched on this too, really is, you know, building this community of support for the people in the, the, the women in the program, the children in the program, that sisterhood, that, that supportive community. And how do you do that during a pandemic when you can have that one-on-one -on -one, um, touch points with volunteers? We're trying to find really creative ways of doing that. And I think I think that, that, that we've learned a lot along the way in, in making that happen. Uh, one of the things we're doing, we've got a, a mentorship, peer mentorship program going on right now with Zumbro Valley Medical Society with some of the medical students now with some of the Jeremiah moms. Um, just being able to have those connections, those community connections, that feeling of belonging and, and you know, dealing with that isolation. Um, it's just really critical uh, to be able to move forward. Commissioner Hall and Commissioner Cascaden, everybody, 
You are all rays of sunshine that have brought some sunshine to our viewers, I know, and to me personally in this hour that you've shared. Thank you so much uh, for all your service and everything you do. Um, I think it, it's going to help a lot of people and maybe some folks will get involved and, and uh, we can improve the situation. But I thank you so much for taking part in this discussion and uh, for all you've done with trying to end poverty. I'm Eric Olson, KSMQ Public Television. This has been Tripping the Poverty Trap, a conversation about generational poverty. Thank you so much for watching. Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.